Oh, and I forgot to put myself live, but it's all good now. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Homo Ludens, the channel on history and board games. Uh, tonight's live stream would be split in two. Uh, first, we'll chat with uh, Maurice Suckling about his new game for Worthington Publishing, 1565 Siege of Vienna, that is currently on Kickstarter for a final hour, so it's now or never. Uh, and then for the end of the show, we'll actually have Pete and Dave joining us um, uh, after after the, my chat with Morris to talk about the new podcast they are launching about uh, Wargaming. Uh, for those who are you who are live, first of all, thanks for joining us uh, tonight. And remember that you can comment and post your questions in the live chat, uh, so uh, behind uh, underneath that video, uh, and I will be happy to bring them on screen and ask your question to Morris. But uh, let's let's jump into it and let's see uh, my guest. Hi, Maurice. I can see that you're here. Can you still hear us? I can, yes. Hello, Fred. Perfect. Hi, Maurice. Thanks for joining. Hi. And hi, Cisco in the chat. Happy to have you with us, uh, <laughs> but that's that's really nice of you to uh, to join uh, us uh, tonight. So as I was saying a bit earlier, um, uh, you have uh, currently uh, the Siege of Malta, so 1565, uh, as part of a three pack uh, in the Kickstarter from Worthington uh, in the Great Siege series. We'll talk a bit about this uh, later, about the the historical context as we usually do here, and then we'll talk about the game itself. Um, but first of all, how are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. Thanks for uh, ha inviting me on and having me here to talk about games and history, two uh, excellent subjects, well chosen, I feel. So uh, yeah, thank you. And yeah, I just it's the last hour of that uh, yes. Worthington Kickstarter. Uh, I don't know if there's a, there's a link anywhere. Yeah, but, yeah, there is a link in the description if, if people want to check it out, but... Um... <clears throat> So, but in another tab, so they can still be here and be convinced uh, Wonderful. Uh, yeah, by your words. But yeah, uh, so <laughs> definitely check it out. Um, and actually, uh, before we start, uh, as you were saying, it's the the final hour of the campaign uh, on Kickstarter for for this uh, for those three games uh, in this in this uh, Worthington series. How did the campaign go? Are you guys happy with the results? Um, how did it? What's your overall impression of those, uh, I think it was three weeks, right? Or 20 days, or slightly a bit under three weeks. Yeah, I think it was about 20 days. It's now, I'm just looking now, it's at um, 84,863, so 580 backers. So uh, I, I I, don't know, my assumption is that that's, that's uh, that the guys are pretty happy with that and that that's what they were uh, hoping for perhaps that's even exceeded what they were hoping for and I know that they had this idea to to, to bundle everything together to bundle Malta with Syracuse and the second edition of, of Quebec and uh, I don't know as far as I can tell I think that they they're, they're really happy with that okay but that's great and that's a that's that was a, actually a pretty uh, aggressive expansion of the series because i've heard about uh, the quebec one uh, originally uh, those three games that are in the campaign right now are three completely new designs or some of them are or uh, second like second printings of previous games yeah so the, the quebec came out originally 2018 the one of the games in this bundle is the second edition of quebec which has i believe some fairly minor changes. Um, I'm not too sure what the scale of them is, but uh, I think that they're smaller rather than excessive. And Syracuse is, is a Dan Furry design that's brand new. And the other one is, yeah, Malta. But, you know, they're all using the same system that that yeah. original uh, used, it's the same I, I don't think any of us have, have kind of deviated too much from that core that yeah, core approach. And actually, I would have some some questions uh, further uh, down in the interview to talk about the, sure. um, the system itself and and some of the changes that you integrated to it because it's covering a very wide period of time. So um, Syracuse is um, uh, like minus four hundred something like this, or I don't remember. Then you have Malta, so that's uh, mid sixteenth century, and then you have Quebec. Quebec is second half of the eighteenth century, so quite a big period of time, a very different military doctrine. So that's, yeah, that's definitely something that I would like to, to bring up and, and talk a bit about. But before we talk about the history, before we talk about 
uh, about um, this game and this campaign. I would like actually maybe to start to, to know a bit more about you, Maurice. Uh, so who are you? What um, and so who you are? What are you doing? And what actually brought you to to work game design? Okay. Um... You have Let's one minute. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I guess like lots of war game designers, right? Um, I was doing this when I was a kid. So I was uh, watching movies and going straight to my Lego people or s sort of tiny toy soldiers and recreating Rock's Drift or whatever it was. And, and that sort of soon turned into essentially making miniatures games and board games and all of that was sort of happening at the same time it was sort of my way into history so i would be in, in the process of playing games or designing them i would be i mean and most of them were terrible games uh, but in the process of doing that i was learning about history so I, I was kind of doing the research and that would be my my spur to kind of want to read more and understand more so uh, you know i've been doing it for forever but only recently have i been doing it in any vaguely professional capacity but that, that's as a that's as a board game designer but i spent most of the last 20 years as a professional video game developer making all kinds of things so um driver in 1999 was a, a playstation one game and that was my that was my very first game and since then I, I've worked on, uh, I'm not really sure, sort of over 50 published titles of all sorts of different genres and different yeah. platforms or different publishers. And that's actually the question that I had. So what, what genres did you, were you, did you approach when it came to, to video games? So you said Driver originally in 99 was your first project, but then it looks yeah. like you, you touched on, on a lot of different topics. Yeah, just, I, I mean, most, so I think I've done most genres party games and adventure games and shooting games and i've worked on we fit as a audio producer and uh, some of my favorite games that i worked on would be things like borderlands the pre-sequel when i worked down mm. at, in australia the 2k australia uh, i was the narrative director on that project running the the writing team working in collaboration with Gearbox, who were uh, in, in Dallas. And uh, I don't know, I did some consultancy for, for Fortnite. And uh, I did some narrative design for Planet of the Apes Last Frontier. Yeah. Uh, so, so not kind of so much on the writing side, but on the organizing the, the narrative flow and the approach to the experience that the, that the players got trying to figure out how to track variables and, and, and so on so that it was a, it was a branching structure story. So all sorts of all sorts of things like that. And I still do some of this from time to time. So I was a consultant for Lost Words Beyond the Page, which is a game that just came out on Switch uh, that is about a young girl and, and her adventures inside her diary and in her mind as she's coming to terms with the illness of her grandmother and I'm working with Luke Hughes and the uh, Green Trees team on Burden of Command. I'm working as a voice producer. Okay. And, and, and director for them. Yeah. And Burden of Command actually goes close more closely to, to, to war gaming because of all the reference that you gave where where um, uh, either shooters or racing game or more you know experimental uh, kind of games. But uh, you you didn't really when you were working in the video game industry you didn't necessarily did a lot of war gaming. No, I worked. I did some work on Civilization VI, so I, I worked on the tutorials for that section. And you know, like like any respectable writer, I got to write some lines for Sean Bean, who then you know died in the course of yes, that as he usually so, does. Yeah. yeah. So so yeah, but. Um, not really. So in the video game world, historical games tend to be dominated by Creative Assembly's Total War series, which I, I'd never uh, worked on, or more uh, experimental stuff, I suppose, or more conventional stuff, so Slytherin type of, type of war games. But, but really, my 
area of focus was as a writer and a narrative designer most of the time. So uh, yeah, stuff that needed sort of more heavy lifting on the writing side would be what I would get to do. And sometimes that would cool on, it would draw on some of my interests in, in history, but that predominantly wasn't what I was working on. Lots of sci-fi stuff, lots of contemporary set dramas or sort of dramas set in the 1970s or, or, or what have you. So I didn't get to play about in that kind of world that that much and, and even if it, you didn't uh, work on wargaming in the in the video game world i have a general question is that that experience as as someone who works on game design and game development in the video game industry did you transpose some of that experience in your um, in your approach to uh, board game design so i think so i, th I think so Um, specifically, I can give a specific example that, that I'm thinking of, but I, I think in general, so look, I was playing from a, a kid until my early 20s, and then I, I sort of fell out of the, the hobby and, you know, other life happened. And I think that seems to be quite often what happens to, to lots of us. And then, you know, it wasn't until my uh, early 30s that I got more interested in in games again, in, in those kinds of war games, in, in board games. Yeah. But so I remember reading this uh, this wonderful collection called Zones of Control that Pat Harrigan and Matthew Kirschenbaum edited. And in that, there's a there's just a series of chapters, essays by all sorts of different people, designers and commentators of various kinds. There's one particular one that I especially enjoy, and it's by... Rachel Simmons, who did Napoleon's Triumph and Guns of Gettysburg and Napoleon at mm. Marengo. And in that she talks about, so she had a similar kind of trajectory, a similar kind of path where she also fell out of the hobby at the same kind of time. And I think fell out of the hobby for the same kinds of reasons, not just life stuff, but also just feeling uh, like there are too many games on the shelf that were never getting played, that were heavy, that had lots of rules, lots of complexities, lots of moving pieces. And uh, Rachel Simmons talked about this in a way that I um, resonated a lot with me, where she, she talked about how she admired these designs that had a, a short distance between the, the idea that a player could have and their ability to put it into action, their ability to make it into reality. So this, this in some ways is really to do with perhaps subjectivity more than anything else. Uh, but she's talking about a preference that I share for games that aren't interested in making you perform small incremental movements that build up over many, many turns and many, many hours, but is more interested in a shorter span of, and I don't just mean playtime or that too, but, but a shorter span of options that are more critical. So they, they mean more and you have fewer of them. So the game probably is going to last less time, but those that, that really wasn't the kind of style of game that we were getting at the time in the, in the sort of 90s, early 90s. And I, I just was buying a lot of games that I was never really playing or playing a bit of and then just, just feeling disenchanted by. Mm. And I got back into... I got back into Uh, games at the time, these kinds of games at the time that we just started seeing people open up m more and, and do more, uh, I, don't know, I suppose a more, instead of a reliance on details, more of a reliance on essence or, or games that uh, were, uh, allowed themselves to be more abstract, but in, in, in so being, they open them up open themselves up to be more accessible in all sorts of ways. So things like Condottieri, for example, or a more recent example, I, I guess, would be things like Ian Brody's Quartermaster General series. Anyway, so that's yep. all along the way around saying that, that what Rachel Simmons is talking about, this kind of idea of seeing, well, I'm interested in decision points that I can, that I can give players that are more meaningful. This was not exactly a mantra or really a principle, but sort of general approaches that I found myself taking as a narrative designer, as a, as a writer working in video games and found that that also was what I wanted to do in these sorts of, in these kinds of games. 
Um, but more specifically, there's an example. So I, I did a game with Worthington that came out last year called Chancellorsville 1683. And it was a, uh, using this battle formation system that I developed for Freeman's Farm, which is my first published board game. And in that, I devised a, a solo bot, which allowed you to play single player. But that solo bot represented, it kind of had a way of, of retaining hidden movement, even though you're playing against yourself. Hmm. And it did that through tracking effectively tracking a number of potential variables that those pieces could have moved to on previous turns and this is all done just by turning over a card and 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 by moving a little piece up a track that's that's sort of keeping keeping track of how many turns it's been since you saw that unit that enemy unit do something and when i started to design this i was intrigued where it come from because i hadn't seen this elsewhere and I, I i wasn't consciously leveraging anything that I, I knew about and i realized that it probably came from working on branching story structures that and tracking a number of variables over the you know, entire story sequence and and figuring out well what's the possible intersection of those those different variables and, and what's the possible meaning that you might end up or what's the, what's the possible context you might sit within and have that variable then uh, track so uh, you know you wouldn't really particularly I hadn't particularly thought that that would be the case that I would bring stuff over from from narrative design I suppose into thinking about designing war games so if we put everything together in a way what you're saying is that uh, reducing the path between the idea of the player and the action that he's taking on the board and and reducing the number of um, uh, potential iterations that you can take and branch out makes you th would say build a stronger narrative because if you get the idea from actually building stories and branching out it does make the case that having this approach to 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 game design actually potentially also brings a stronger narrative into play would you say that that you yeah. you're yeah that's maybe an, an approach that you have in in the way you approach design building stronger yeah. narratives yeah i think so i think that um, thinking about narrative, not just in terms of the story that you're attempting to represent, but also thinking about narrative in terms of the player's experience as well. So yeah. uh, another, another example I, I, I can give that just comes to mind is the, is the combat system in, in Freeman's Farm and chances for in that, in that battle formation system. And I noticed that, that there's lots of designs that I've played over the years where the my least favorite bit this is less so uh, less true now but it's certainly more true in the 1980s uh, there are plenty of designs where my least favorite part of the, the the game experience was the combat and you would think well that doesn't make any sense that ought to be the apex of the drama right that ought to be the most exciting part of the game where you've got these two forces and they clash and then yeah. let's roll some dice or turn over some cards or whatever the mechanism is and you get something interesting happening. And I noticed that I was playing these games where instead of that being this kind of dramatic moment, it would be just a fizzle because you would roll some dice, check some modifiers, recheck them, count them. You yeah. don't have to maybe do some fractions and figure out, well, you, know, you lose a third of I've won, so, you, so you'll take a third off casualty. You know? And then by the time you've done all of that, you've lost that 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 sort of Theat the momentum, yeah. theatrical moment. So uh, in, in that case, I, I really liked what uh, happens in uh, King of Tokyo when you roll dice. Yeah. And how there's a degree of strategy and you, everyone is captured in that moment. So although I was thinking about the storytelling, in fact, I, in many ways, I was thinking about the storytelling for the, for the players and how I could get them involved in that moment. And, and the dice would would roll and you would see the faces and everyone would know pretty much instantly what it meant yeah so so yeah so i mean i suppose yes having spent a lot of time thinking about stories i think that that sort of feeds through into it's, it's, 
It's a very interesting point, and I agree uh, on the anticlimactic aspect of uh, combat result tables. I think so. It's a good point. A lot of grognards are going to be unhappy about this, but it's a. I think it's a. It's a. It's a very fair point. Uh, and we, I'm just going to pop up a, a quick question from from Alan here. And by the way, uh, hi Alan. Uh, happy to have you. Uh, almost every week now, it feels like we've been Alan, we've been having Alan on the show for for a while. So fascinating conversation of the world question. Talking about narrative and systems, do you think war game design is more literature or engineering? Well, uh, I I hope you don't think I. Uh, hello, uh, uh, Alan, as well. Thank you, thank you for the question. I hope you don't think I'm dodging the question, uh, but but I'm going to say it's it's both. So look. I've spent my life as a storyteller in games, and frequently this this kind of uh, ludo narrative debate gets gets thrown around. Like, is it a story? Is 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 it a game? How should we be thinking about it? Where's the primacy? And I I think that ultimately it's about how you blend that that ludo narrative or or narrow ludog ludological, if you like. <laughs> that's kind of, a, well, that's a lot of. <laughs> <laughs> how do you do that? How do you do that together, right? So, um, and, and I think that how do you do that in such a way that you're concerned about the experience that you're going to give to to the player? This is this has changed in in video games a lot over the last twenty years. My my first experiences in this were uh, me showing up to work in a in a game studio and designers, one designer saying, "Why are you here? Why don't you go write a novel?" But less politely than that. And uh, the more conciliatory ones suggesting that, well, look, I don't care what you do with your story, just keep the hell away from my game. Now, this has changed a lot in, in, in video games. And I also see that a broad uh, a kind of approach in, in analog design seems to me that it's less driven by concerns of, if you like, a, an engineering background and more concerned by, by, by narrative, by literature, but it cannot possibly stand alone like that. It, it, needs, it needs both those, the systems need to, be, yeah. need to be articulate and need to be narrative driven, but the narrative uh, is, is, is nothing if it's not supported and told through those systems. So I, I honestly don't, I'm not trying to dodge that question, but I really think it's it's just both. So I don't see it as one or the one or the other. I think it's a it's a, I agree with you. It's a mix of both, and maybe to to answer Alan, I, I would say that you need the one to support the other, as you as you were saying, Maurice. And I would say if it's more engineering or literature, I think it would highly depend on the designer. Also, like it's a, I think a, making a war game is a mix of both, and then what the person brings to the table will actually have an impact on where the game is on that spectrum. Um, and just maybe to conclude on that uh, old arc around uh, narrative in, 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 in wargaming, because we're already 25 minutes in, so it's going really fast and we still haven't talked about the game. <laughs> uh, we have a question about NB here. Uh, NB that is really um, interested into in narrative design uh, coming from the Coin Discord server. I guess some of them might be in there. Uh, and he's asking, what are some of your favorite uh, narrative player arc you've, uh, been you've had in playing war games? Try to keep it short, because then we'd need to talk about the game. I mean, yeah, the, the, the self-formulating out there, there are things where, you know, for example, you get to uh, invade Britain early in World War I by, by surprising them with an amphibious invasion as the BEF jumps over to France. So, so but, or whatever, you know, the point is that there are things facilitated by the system that 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 are there. So I, I just have this tendency to, to like these I games that facilitate these bigger ideas that are easier to uh, faster to implement. So so that just means that I have a preference for a certain type of, of game, which I, th I think generally speaking would, would now be described as kind of a lighter type of uh, type of mm -hmm. game. So so but I'm just in trying to answer that, that question. Yeah, it's it's stuff that's that you feel is self-formulated, that you're responsible for it, but really the system has allowed for you to, to, to do that all along. And it's, it's the designers are really <laughs> getting to do it really. But I think to 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 NB's point here, do you have like a, a like a, a game that you have in mind, like an experience that you had as a player that really struck you as a as a as an excellent narrative moment? 
as a as a player more maybe well so uh one of my fa my favorite avalon hill game growing up was a game called hitler's war which was a hex-based game but it was described as the game that third reich could have been or the, the game that third reich should have been and it was a shorter smaller faster neater more uh interesting in my opinion version of that so it, it allowed you to research atom bombs it, it allowed you to, to research different kinds of uh, weaponry and uh, to to kind of jump ahead of, of real timelines in order to, to do so in order to make things cheaper or in order to to, to give you new types of, of weaponry so that you could be changing history in, in big dramatic ways so that, that i mean that's just that's a game that i particularly liked as i said growing up but now there's just there's plenty of, of, of games I, i'm a huge fan of the uh Uh, quartermaster general series for, for that yeah. kind of flexibility that it has for allowing you to make these big adventurous uh, to, to ex try and execute these big adventurous ideas and and do it all within two hours now let's look talk about about uh, 1565 uh, siege of malda which is the 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 game that um, I, i'm i we're we're planning on on talking about uh, uh, tonight so currently on kickstarter once again for those who of you who joined and actually if you see the, this board just in front of maurice yeah that's actually the prototype uh, so those are prototype components of the of the game uh, so you So that's part of the the Great Siege um, series from Worthington Publishing that is uh, that is uh, that is currently on on Kickstarter. Uh, maybe before talking about the game specifically, just to have a bit of an overview and and, and so all the viewers understand what you're expecting in that uh, in that game. Um, could you give us a bit of an overview of what happened in 1565 in Malta? Uh, what were the factions in present uh, present and 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 what, how actually yeah. the uh, the siege unfolded? Sure, I'm going to uh, share a screen actually. Yeah, I'm gonna, sure. I'm going to add it there. And I'm going to add it to the stream. So that's the cover of the game. Yep. Oh, and you're taking the la laser pointer, right? Oh, uh, yeah, just trying to find it. I don't remember where you found it last time. No, oh. let's see if I can find it here. Here we go. Yes. All righty. I mean, awesome. I mean, all right. So, okay, let's step up back a bit. So, 1565, we've got Malta, the siege that's over here. Discusses the Mediterranean Sea. So, we've got Siege of Acre. That falls in 1291. So we've got the Crusader kingdoms. We've got them all up this this Levant. We've got the Siege of Acre. So just for context, that. you're talking about the expansion of the Ottoman Empire. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, and and yeah, the, the sort of fall of, of Christian Jerusalem. So we've got the uh, Knights Hospitallers one of the the most renowned holy orders knights temple but one of the other probably more famous ones anyway they get kicked out of the knights of uh of st john knights hospitals get kicked out of acre in 1291 they they, they lose they uh, spend a bit of time roaming around they end up in roads not because people of roads wanted them but The people of Rhodes lost as the uh, uh, knights decided that's where they were going to stay. We've got uh, we've got them there 15, uh, up to 1522. But around this time, we've got we've got the Ottoman Empire expanding and kind of crushing the the, the remnants of the Byzantine Empire. Constantinople falls in 15, sorry, 1453. And that you you can see that that just that sort of uh, makes things very difficult for the for the knights and for the Christians who are kind of just desperately trying to cling on to to this this territory, hoping 
all the time to get back to, to the Holy Land to retake that. Anyway, 1522, after trying to hold out for a long time, they finally lose. The Ottomans come, crush them there. They, in fact, are allowed, they cut a deal with the, with the Turks and they are allowed to, to leave in with their armor and their banners and their holy relics. And uh, the, the, the Sultan allows them to, to depart. They don't really have anywhere to go. No one really wants them. They're homeless. We've got people starting to get fed up with these holy orders. The Templars get uh, effectively banned because, well, they're not really that holy anymore. They're really just um, political opportunists probably and all sorts of corruptions going on anyway the, the tempers get shut down which is actually kind of good news for the for the knights hospitalers who whose um membership doubles as a result of that yeah but they they end up being given malta by uh the uh, charles v the holy roman emperor who, who doesn't charge them anything. It's basically a rock, a couple of rocks, uh, but he doesn't charge them anything. He just charges them a, a, a yearly tribute of a Maltese falcon, which later turns into a, 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 a movie. Um, so the knights are here. They're effectively becoming pirates at this point, intercepting Turk trade. They're a huge nuisance. The Ottomans want to get get rid of them. Ottoman strength is, is growing. There's pressure on the gates of, of Vienna. The Europe is, is pretty fractured. And uh, the Malta is actually not one island. It's, it's two main islands, Gozo and Malta. The, the Turks check out Malta. They come and try and take it, but they don't have enough forces, don't have uh, the right kinds of weaponry. And they they don't stay very long. They then there's a battle of Gerba down here. Christians outnumber the it's a, it's a naval battle. Christians outnumber the, the Turks, but lose badly. And then pretty much that's, that's 1560. At this point, the the Knights of Malta know that the Turks are coming for them. You can see it's it's uh, strategic significance, and that it, it would be a sort of a stepping stone for for the Turks to then take Sicily and then take Southern Italy. There's already lots of pressure then on Spain. France actually has a sort of an alliance with the Turks at that point. Mm. Um, but, you know, I'm sure if the Turks had been successful in the rest of Europe, they wouldn't have uh, necessarily honored that for long. So 1565, we get, we get this massive siege a siege of huge significance that if the Turks had won there, what I just described most is, is most likely what would have happened. It would have transformed Western Europe, bearing in mind all of this all of this is Ottoman at, at this, this point. point. Yeah. Yeah. And this doesn't really change significantly uh, until so 1571 you get the Battle of Lepanto, an extremely important naval encounter where the, the Turk fleet is destroyed by the Christian Western powers. But, uh, and so this kind of breaks the back of Turkish naval domination of the Mediterranean, but it's not really until 1683 where the last siege of Vienna fails, when that, that pressure really starts to, to, to come off. But, you know, bearing in mind, it's not until the early 1900s that these Balkan countries start to get independence from from Turkey. So, you know, and you, it takes you right up until the to the end of World War One until till Turkish power is substantially broken across this region. So, anyway, it, that siege of Malta. The, why I'm interested in it is just because it, it's it's such a hugely significant moment in in Western European history and possibly global history. So what you're saying is that uh, this, with the Battle of Lepanto, could have been a tipping point into the into the uh, the Ottomans having naval control over Mediterranean and could have shaped differently. So there was, this was actually a crucial moment uh, within the uh, the expansionist effort 
And by the way, just a small note, I don't for I don't know if if you if for the viewers here, but the Battle of Lepanto just had a game released on it uh, uh, by a Italian publisher called ACS Edizioni. So if you're interested in the topics, that could be a nice follow-up to Morris's game. Uh, if you want to play the, the Battle of Lepanto, I would strongly recommend to to check it out. Thank but you. yeah, so I, tipping I, point. Yeah, I um I actually just put me in mind that uh, so Robert Daleski is also working on a Siege of Vienna 1683 game. Yes, I'm which... going to talk about it later, actually. Right. <laughs> so, okay. Yes, but because so... I intended to talk about the Robert Lesky's also um, approach to siege warfare and discuss if you've if all, if you've also tried it. But right. yeah. Okay. So um, yeah, look, you know, uh, as is always the way, right? We we interpret history, and it, it always sort of seems like things are inevitably the case, but they're they're just not. So in 1565, when these knights held on. Of course, they expected the Turks to come back. And even though Suleiman the Magnificent died soon after, it was, they still expected the Turks to come back. They expected the Turks to come back for many, many years. So 1571, yes, with, with Lepanto, a big, uh, a, a massive victory for the, for the uh, Western powers, the, the Christians. But, you know, 1560, just a few years earlier, that had been a massive Turkish victory just, just north of uh, Tunisia. So I don't know, it was far from certain that this was over. It was far from certain that everything was now peachy and that that uh, Malta was safe. And so therefore the rest of Europe was safe. But, you know, it, the other interesting thing about this is that the Western countries, although it would have affected them hugely, they, they largely did nothing to help. They basically sort of said, good luck. Uh, we hope you do okay, because you, you know they had concerns about their own safety. That's a part of the reason that it took such a long time for significant reinforcements, and they weren't even that significant when they did come. It took such a long time for them to come from Sicily was that people were concerned that, well, if we lose, if Malta's lost, we're going to need these troops to defend ourselves yeah. anyway. And, you know, the Holy Roman Empire is not exactly on better terms with France, England, of course, bearing in mind Knights Hospital is, well, essentially a Catholic order. We've got the Reformation that happened not that long before where Henry VIII kicked out, uh, he dissolved the monasteries. He obviously became a, a, a Protestant nation. We've got Elizabeth on the throne now and she's, she's concerned about it, but it's not like she's sending English Any kind of help. troops. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's one English knight uh, at the battle, and he's—I mean—he's a knight. He's—he's he's there on the because he's part of that order. He's not sent there by the by the English. And you know, we, we think of the. Let me just jump back a moment. We think of the the, the Spanish Armada, 1588, as this massive moment with this massive Armada. The Armada that sailed on Malta was three times the size. So, uh, you know, to me, it's just this interesting moment that is largely, it's quite often, it's, I don't think it's very well known in the, in, the, in the United States at all. And even in Europe, in lots of Europe, I don't think it's that well known. In Malta, of course, they're pretty, pretty much aware of it. But it's yeah. this moment where these knights were kind of five, six hundred knights with about five, six thousand others, civilians and galley slaves and all sorts of people assembled and volunteers assembled to kind of defend Malta from about 40,000 Ottoman Turks. And really Europe is looking on, fingers crossed, but not really doing much other than sending best wishes. And so how did the how did the battle unfold itself? Okay, so let me jump to that. So we've got Suleiman yeah. Magnificent. He's, he's the uh, ruler of the Ottoman Empire. And we've got Jean Paiso de Vallette, who is the... Uh, head of the order and so those are the opposing commanders but Suleiman didn't command his own forces he had this isn't actually them this is just a picture of three Ottoman noblemen but but we have it, it's one of the situations with conflicting unclear uh, command structures we've got Mustafa Pasha who is in charge of the army Piali Pasha who's in charge of the navy and Dragu who is a, a senior corsair and the Turkish command structure is, is sort of, it's confused. So Mustafa Pasha is younger. He's told to uh, be reverent to Payali Pasha, 
who is older and in charge of the Navy. These guys constantly are loggerheads. They frequently can't agree anything. And they're both told in a somewhat, um, so, so Mustafa is nominally in charge, but told to defer to Piali Pasha and show reverence to him. And then Dragu, who is not there to the, at the beginning of the, of the siege is, they're told in a sort of confusing way, they're told, well, listen to him, uh, but he's not exactly in command because he's not exactly a Turk. Uh, and, and he shows up finally and uh, actually runs things pretty well until he gets killed. So anyway, that's part of the problem that the Turks have. This is, these are sort of some of the, gives you an idea of, of the kind of rough figures involved that, that sort of forces in play here. About 6,000 on the night side and about 40,000 on the, on the Turk side. Not, this doesn't include the, the ships. It's probably about 380 ships that the Turks came with. So that there are, already we can see that there is a, a massive uh, power difference uh, between the, the, <laughs> yes. the, the two factions. So one, yeah. yeah so we have a, a small group of uh, knights on a rock, and then we have uh, four times the the amount, or actually, yeah, even almost almost five times that. Just uh, oh, yeah. forty thousand in all. Okay, so yeah. yeah, because you have two separate uh, contentions, one coming from the east, and all the other one. that's that's a massive power yeah. difference. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely massive. So what happens is the Turkish fleet arrives from the eastern Mediterranean. It, so this is this larger island, Malta, the smaller island, Gozo, that's where they came about 10 years. I'm sorry, four years, four years earlier. No, 14 years earlier. Um, and then, so they, this is, this is Grand Harbor here, if you can see my point. Yeah. So, oops. So that's, that's where the three significant fortresses are. The fortress of St. Elmo and the fortress on Burgu and fortress on Sanglia. And there's also this city here, Medina, which is, which was the capital, uh, which is also significant. Anyway, the, the Turks uh, show up, they're looking for a harbor. They end up harboring here. They realize it's actually not such a great place for them to be. They come back, they find a harbor here, Masaklok Bay, which is actually a very good place for them to harbor. It's sheltered. Uh, and then they set about trying to decide what what to do. They can't decide whether to which of these fortresses to hit first. There's a debate as to whether they should hit Medina, which uh, Mustafa Pasha prefers to do. Piali Pasha persuades him not to do, and they decide to to leave it. Now, ultimately, that might have been been their un, undoing. It essentially by not taking care of that, the Maltese. There were a few knights there, but uh, mostly there were not knights there. We're able to, to continue raiding, particularly cavalry raids, which just meant they were a constant pain for the the Turkish forces who, who were camped here over by the, by the Masa. So what happens is the Turks decide they're going to hit St. Elmo first. They build these, these trenches. They pour a lot of uh, artillery into this, but it's it's not very well organized. They they want to, uh, Piali Pasha doesn't want cannon to be taken off his ships. So they're, they're a little undergunned, but they they decide to hit here. They're, they're kind of frequently pestered by by the Maltese who are, who are raiding them occasionally, raiding this this camp. So this, this is a prototype board that shows you the Grand Harbor, but it also kind of jumps around and it shows you the, the section of Malta where the, the Turkish fleet was harbored and also Medina, which was was fortified. So we get essentially the, the Turks just keep concentrating mostly on St. Elmo, occasionally on these other two fortresses, on these two peninsulas. But... Uh, de Valette is, is able to keep shuttling troops across Grand Harbor. Most nights he's able to, to bring wounded back, patch them up. He's able to, to get reinforcements back to St. Elmo. 
and keep a balanced force on each of his in each of his three fortresses, so that the, the Turks never really managed to to get overwhelming odds anywhere. Well, then Dragu shows up and says, "What the hell are you doing? Why haven't you taken Medina? Why haven't you? Why have you started on St. Elmo? Never mind. We'll deal with it since you've already started." He he then concentrates more fire on here and, and St. Elmo uh, starts to suffer. He starts getting, he starts taking advantage of places like this, Gallows Point, which allow him to um, it, triangulate fire. It's just, it becomes very difficult for these, these uh, Maltese defenders to, to fend, fend them off anymore. And one night there's a, uh, a sentry is asleep at his post or perhaps killed by a sniper or something else happened. Anyway, they, the, the Turks managed to capture this ravelin, which makes it essentially impossible for St. Elmo to, to survive. And it's looking very bad, but but Dragu is killed by accident, possibly by the defenders or possibly by his own side, by an inexperienced gunner who was firing too low and a, a ricochet comes and you know, cannibal sh- strikes him and he dies a few days later. This is a, a big, a big blow for uh, Turkish morale. And, and then we're back to Mustafa Pasha and Piali Pasha just being this kind of mess again, of, of kind of really essentially two different ideas and, and they just couldn't coordinate. Yeah. So, uh, but Mustafa Pasha does do something that was possibly inspired by Drago, we don't know, but he, he basically dismantles the ships in this bay and they, they march them five years, five miles inland to, to place them in Master Creek. And once there, you can see that, well, now they can apply pressure through Grand Harbor. Now they can stop. Now they can stop at develop ferrying troops across so easily it's it's pretty much curtains for St. Elmo St. Elmo uh, falls the some of the knights uh, ask for permission to be able to to surrender it and develop says no uh, every every day matters that they're, they're trying to get so this up here is representing Sicily that's the boot of it's the toe of the boot of, of Naples of Italy, yeah no, they're hoping to get these reinforcements from Sicily that, well, a few small reinforcements, a few small detachments have arrived or one arrives. A few others were sent, but they just never got there. They're hoping that these are going to arrive in time to appear on here to, to apply pressure. But um, it's not certain that the, the game doesn't make it certain that they will arrive. And um, even if they do, that's, it doesn't necessarily mean that everything's fine. So, uh, so Valette says, no, you absolutely cannot uh, surrender every every day. Every day uh, just is critical to us. The the fortress is taken. Uh, probably, I think nine. They think nine knights survived at the end. We don't know what happened to them. Perhaps they were killed. Perhaps they were uh, became galley slaves. But the the Bodies of the killed knights were decapitated and then floated down Grand Harbour towards towards the defenders. Valette responds by taking all his prisoners, chops their heads off and uses them as cannonballs to demonstrate his displeasure. And uh, at that point, we're, so we're getting into... Uh, late June now, at that point, Burgu comes under increasing pressure. It looks like Burgu is going to fall. There's a, there's a uh, bridge of boats here that is how they, they get to ferry people across. And Valette, again, Burgu, the, the defenders there say, well, maybe we should surrender this one. And again, Valette says, no, every day, every day is critical. He burns this bridge of boats as a sort of demonstration that here's where we, we stand and and full and uh, but you know the Turks are running out of time so the the tides are such that the Turks have to either winter in Malta or or go back because uh, 
they cannot keep bringing in the winter they cannot keep sailing east to west with more supplies so yeah. they have to either have them with them uh, or, or just go back with the fleet and they couldn't take obviously infinite amounts of supplies they're constantly raided the the, the Maltese have poisoned the water so making it hard for them to to stay here but when the Turks took roads they you know roads is quite verdant that they were able to live off the land well Malta doesn't afford you that it's not very fertile on top of which the the Maltese knew that the Turks were coming they had five years after Gerba the Battle of Gerba expecting them to come so their defenses were sort of well in a fairly good state but also when spies reported that the fleet was on its way de Vallette, uh, got he harvested everything to leave the Turks with as little as possible so that they they couldn't sustain themselves for long so the turks are fighting this timer the whole time and it's getting late getting late in the season they're getting very demoralized they they lose massive amounts of men uh they some figures say twenty five thousand. some figures say thirty five thousand. so if they got forty thousand, i mean they're just huge numbers of men killed in battle or or uh, suffering from disease i mentioned the water was poisoned but also malnutrition and uh, it doesn't help that the two commanders just cannot <laughs> really coordinate anything. Yeah, I agree. And, yes. and uh, they're, they're just sort of just about leaving, really, when, when there's news of this uh, Sicilian detachment, this re these reinforcements showing up. And it sounds like, well, it's time to go then because there's there's probably the 16,000 of them and uh, we just we can't deal with that and then they suddenly they're kind of uh, uh, um, they're just about embarking and they realize well no wait a minute maybe oh actually but that's not 16,000 I think it's 8,000 so then they kind of rush a few more men out to try and deal with that but it's it's all badly coordinated it's all just kind of a, a disaster and the nights the nights hold on and 8th of September the the Turks leave tails between their their legs and the two commanders obviously fearful that they're probably going to get their heads chopped off because that's what happens if you don't do things right okay but i think that's so that gives the the, the main narrative of the of how the event un unfolded um and i think maybe it would be nice now maybe to to look into the the game so you have the board in front of you and maybe we can uh, have a, a bit of a look at that and see how you how you um and I'm going to remove that. Uh, how yeah, you represented yeah. this in the in the in the game itself. So I'm going to put you here. Yes, a bit of a focus on you. So here we can see the okay. so on the on the bottom we can see the board, uh, and we can see the 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 three citadels that you were uh, that you were uh, that you were showing on the map uh, with the with those blue boxes, so Saint Elmo, and then you have the other two that are connected through the the bridge boat. And so, how did you how did you represent the, that battle in the in the game? So, so let me yeah, let me uh, step back by telling you a bit about the system. So, the system essentially so this game works as a solo game that I think that others in the in the series work either as a two player from both sides or two player from one side, but they all also uh, are solo. This one I concentrated just on the. The, the solo experience but so in the solo experience you're effectively playing against a deck so if you're the the turks say then you're fighting against the uh, a, a deck of cards which is which represents the abilities capacity to 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 wage war to defend itself of the of the knights and the size of that deck matters so if you're the turks fighting against the Fighting against the knights, it's it gets harder if you have a shorter deck because that represents yeah. the passage of time. It means you you're not going to be around for long enough to do as many things. And and the inverse is true if you're the the knights fighting against the Turks. You you want them to to not be around for very long to make that uh, easier for you. So essentially, what happens on a turn is you 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 look at your uh, your different orders. So I don't think, I don't know if they, you can see them here, but you've got a, a bunch of different orders. So here I've got seven different things that the Turks can do. 
here they're in cards. They might be in a like a field orders book, like the way that Quebec was was published. I'm not sure. Can you maybe um, show? Can you maybe show one of that that yeah, card? Was, uh, to the, just, yes. So again, that's just a prototype card. So you can see that what's what's going to happen here is um, you choose one of your orders that represents a, a movement or or an attack from a specific region on the board. So here, for example, this is approach to St. Elmo, and I could I could do something with this with this section of the board. And then uh, I can I can only choose this if this is if this is refreshed, if this is available to me. But I would choose an option and I would put a uh, a little put block token on a little it. token yeah. on it saying that's what I'm choosing. And then I would turn over the the top card of the of the uh, opposing deck. And that's going to tell me uh, one of three things. It's going to tell me, let me show you one that has three things. It's going to be one of two or three things. And this one with three, some of them are two. So it'll have like a uh, an event just telling you something. It's just capturing some of the sort of narrative detail of something that's happened. So the use of Greek fire, for example, or the uh, uh, someone has deserted and given information to you or uh, Valetta's uh, use heads as cannonballs or what have you. And then the second thing is this counter order. And so you're gonna correspond your choice. With, if I chose this card, let's say it's a, it's a Turkish order two, and this is a, a counter order A, and I'm gonna check check off my, uh, my, my order here and how that corresponds with this A, B, C, D column. Yeah. And I can see, you know, I can see which column I'm gonna roll on then. And so some, some choices you're going to make are going to be work out much better depending on how they correlate with with the enemy's chosen order. It, it represents the area of focus. So um, it's it, in a way, it's kind of a bluff counter bluff uh, game. But you, you kind of lose that element through uh, through solo play. You don't get that sense of bluffing, but you do get the sense of trying to optimize your order so that it will be most effective given what you think the enemy might be doing. So then you, you're looking at one of these four columns and then you roll you roll a die, which is modified maybe by, by a few simple things. And that's going to mean you're gonna lose you, you're gonna lose either morale or troops or troops and morale, or it's gonna be the opposite. And it's gonna be the enemies losing troops and morale or troops. Uh, or, ju or just morale, or perhaps sometimes it'll be a mixture. So essentially, in order to, to win, the Turks need to clear out these three fortresses or reduce the... Uh, morale down to zero. The knight's morale down to zero. And likewise, the, the Turks need to avoid their morale going to zero. And if they don't win by the time the, the, the deck has run out, they haven't done it, then off they go, they leave the island, the tails between their legs, and they and they've lost. So that's that's the essence of it. It's make choose an order, flip over a card, cross refer it, find the column, roll the die, take the result, and and that's the end of the turn. And just so maybe to to put it in perspective with the other game uh, of the of the series and, and and going back to what you you started to uh, to explain at the at the beginning of the of the discussion, so this system is actually applied in um, in a in a lot of different uh, eras, uh, still with the same system, but as we said, like it covers a, a very long period of time, like the siege of Syracuse down to uh, down to Quebec in 1759. So so more than 2000 years of, of, uh, of time is actually going over. So how did you um, be on the map? Because uh, like the map makes it really clear that what you were depicting uh, when you explain the, the historical context, but in the game, in the design itself, in the mechanism, how did you um, uh, represent the specificities of, of that specific era and, and, and siege for warfare in the 16th century? Well, so the first thing is just read stuff, right? And, and just, just try and understand, well, what are the narrative elements that need to, need to exist? So that's, that's what I did before I even really 
thought about the specifics of how I was going to do this. I just wanted to see, could so I just played Quebec and, and I just thought, oh, this is interesting. It's, it's a really nice, accessible, simple system that allows you to get a, a key piece of history pretty quickly. And I knew that Mike and Grant had ideas to, they wanted to do more with this with the system. And I thought, well, I, I wonder what it would be like to work on someone else's system. And I wonder if, if I could do anything. And I read about Malta. I, I, I'd been there and I found it fascinating. And I thought, well, I wonder if Malta could be suitable. So the first thing I did was just read stuff. And then the more I thought about it, the more I thought, actually, it could be quite suitable because you have some choices to make. You, you know, the, the Turks have, there are these sort of, three key fortresses plus Medina, meaning that you, you, it's not it's not just kind of one army just thumping directly against the other. There's this kind of idea of, well, I don't quite know where the focus of the attack is going to be. So, so it felt like it lent itself to what the system did. And, and, and then I just, by, by, by doing the research, I just realized, well, there are things that I needed to represent, that I needed to find a way for the system to, to facilitate. So things like, well, the reinforcements from, from Sicily, I needed a mechanism that would allow for that to, to happen. And sure, I've got cards here, so I could just put it in this card, this deck of cards, right? But um, I mean, that is what I did, but not, not directly. So it isn't just one card that means they show up or not. I, I wanted it to be more, more dramatic and interesting than that. So, so there are a number of icons in here that do a number of different things. But one of the things, one of those types of icons does is it is it gives a sense of the reinforcements building and accumulating. So that bit by bit you might get the sense of the force gathering, which just amps the sense of tension, the sense of drama that uh, could potentially potentially unfold so yeah it's a combination of just just researching and just figuring out well what do i what do i need to have in here that that would feel like i i'm representing this so every every design in a way is you're you're promising something yeah so sure people who don't know the siege of malta you're not promising uh them much beyond a broad sort of i'm going to make a game that's going to cover this topic and, and tell you some things and, and hopefully entertain you. But to those of people who do know something about this, there, there are expectations that they have that, well, you'll have this moment. You'll, you'll have something that speaks to uh, the, the small party of reinforcements that, that arrived. You'll have something that speaks to the mutiny that happened just prior to St. Elmo falling or uh, some reference to the Janissaries and these elite Turkish forces yeah, uh, or, or some reference to poison water, or what have you. So, so you kind of have this kind of list that you generate, and you try and figure out well, how can I find ways in the system to facilitate that, or where do I need to add things to the system to to uh, to make sure that I that I have that element. So, going back to what we were discussing earlier, you felt that the uh, the template had a level of abstraction that enabled you to build a narrative upon it, to to talk about this specific narrative through the events and and how the events unfolded. Uh, yeah, and, and by the way, so earlier you were talking about Robert Deleski's um, uh, game on the Siege of Vienna. So for, for the viewers, uh, Robert Deleski is the designer of two solo games uh, uh, with Hollenspiel, so uh, Wars of Marcus Aurelius and the recently released one, Stilico, or I don't know if I pronounced that right, but uh, yeah, um, uh, ancient uh, era uh, solo uh, solo war games. And he's actually also, yeah, he started working on a, on a Siege of Vienna game, so it's 80 years earlier, uh, and in another part, so that it's not a maritime siege, it's actually uh, the second siege of Vienna or something like this. And I was wondering, have you tried it, and how do you, uh, how what did you think about the the approach that it that he that he took? So I don't know very much about it. Uh, <laughs> I've only seen a few images, and I can see that it's it's a completely different scale, uh, yes. completely different. It's it's more tactical. Uh, it's uh, you know, I can see, um, yeah, it's just, it's just a fine, finer detail. And, and I'm just really interested in, in what I, what I saw, but I just don't know very much about it. And, uh, it, 
it's interesting to see more people taking on the topic of, of sieges. I mean, they're just largely largely neglected, really, both in miniatures wargaming and in board wargaming. If you think about how many thousands of wargames we have, I, I bet you'll find a very small percentage that are really on sieges. And that's actually a question that I wanted to ask you. I, I've talked a bit about siege warfare in, in the past, and, and I would recommend, I have a video about uh, Le Musée des Plans Reliefs, which is a museum in Paris that um, uh, shows the very detailed um, models of, uh, of fortresses uh, all around uh, France and, and neighborhood countries that is focused, that was one main element for the French army in the, in the 17th and 18th century to prepare for siege warfare. And at the end of this video, I'm actually discussing the fact that in wargaming, we don't talk a lot about siege warfare. What do you think that is? Um, that is, it's not that much of a, of a game topic. What makes siege warfare not ideal for, for wargaming? I, I mean, lots of this is to do with perception. They're not, they're not perceived as that, uh, you know, they're perceived as stodgy blood fests that are that are not they're static. Not a lot happens, and not a lot happens for a long time. Sometimes, sometimes sieges last a long, long time, where people have um, no real imperative to mount an offensive because they're slowly strangling the the city, and the, and the defenders don't have an imperative to throw their lives away, hoping that perhaps, well, some relief force is, is going to going to come. So I think that. You know, I think in history as a whole, we, we get more, people are more, their imaginations are more lit by these ideas of dynamic maneuvers and, and dashing cavalry charges and, and genius outflanking plans. And as, as they're generally perceived, sieges don't seem to deliver on that. So they're just, they're a tough commercial prospect, I would have thought on the whole. They're just not as... They don't have this kind of uh, allure to them in general. On top of that, you know, there are real problems about how you, even if even if you push past that and you, you look at some of the specifics and you find that actually they're far more dynamic and intriguing than that, there are some problems about modeling them. Scale, time scale is can, can be can be a difficult issue. And then you know they they can they can be certainly in miniatures wargaming they can look ugly yeah and and, uh, uh, and i think in tactical systems and it can also feel tedious uh, because it's very long uh, stuff and it moves very slowly so you don't really have the illusion of that that work anymore it is so so strong in wargaming i will just point a, a question from from alan that i think is 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 always interesting so alan is asking um what prompted your interest in this topic uh and 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 Alan actually made the point that, and he said it already in the past, because a lot of the, the designers that we see on the show are mostly looking for into lesser known conflicts. And, and I think this is definitely one of them. And he's yeah interested in saying what triggered your 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 will to actually make a make a game on the Sea of Malta. And just for two people who are waiting in the in the in the room, I see that there is Dan and Dave. Just for you to know there is a private chat. So I have a few messages for you there, but yeah, back to the question from 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 Alan. Okay. Uh, well, yeah, I went I went on holiday there, and uh, it's it's just impossible not to be swept away really by all of the the, the talk of the not only the Great Siege but also of course World War Two and the sense of this kind of uh, besieged island uh, nation is just it's just there's just lots of history in there. So it just became fascinating to me. And then uh, I just was just interested in this new system. And really, I, I wanted to just answer that question for myself. I wanted to see, well, what would happen if I took that system and I took it somewhere else and, and multi-popped into my head because I'd been and it was interesting, but also because, yes, it wasn't particularly well known and that, that appealed to me, appealed to me uh, more. And and look, here's the thing: this system is this is a light system. So you know you get you get certain advantages and certain disadvantages with that. The certain advantages being to do with the accessibility, the ease of learning, the ease of play, and and the relative flexibility and the way that this system can abstract things out and abstract them in. So I think in general it would be good at, at 
at approaching all sorts of different, uh, a whole range of eras. We've already seen, as, as, as Fred said, you know, we look at Syracuse up to, up to Quebec. Yeah. And I think it could go, it could go more e either way. But, you know, obviously the, the downsides of the, of the system are that, well, it'll, it'll make that, uh, it'll allow you to make those kinds of games on those kinds of topics, but in a certain type of way that, uh, I don't just mean sort of homogenized. I think that's not entirely true. I think that lots of times the designers will come and they will, they will tweak that system in order to get to the subject matter that, that's important, but it will, it will never be hyper detailed because that's just not what the system excels yeah. at. That's just not what it does. And maybe just one last question because we have we are supposed we're a bit late <laughs> we were supposed to talk about uh, Dave and, and Peter's um, uh, uh, sure. podcast uh, and you're gonna have a, there is a connection to to Maurice so we'll we'll explain about this just one last question from the chat and I just to to let you know I had actually a massive list of questions that I wanted to go through so okay. I'm very sad right now Maurice I'm very very sad to have all, all of right. this go but we'll probably I'll probably have to invite you again on on, on the show because there. There is a lot of things that I want to talk to you about, about not specifically the game, but core game design, the, the relationship with complexity, with the narrative. There is a lot of topics that I want to explore a bit more, but let's take a final question uh, from uh, from Cisco here, and, and then we'll talk about, um, we'll, we'll get the new guest in. So, um, and, and that's more a question around scale, around what a block represents in the game. Uh, and I'm going to put a bit of focus on, on you uh, once again here. And he's asking, uh, what does, um, a block represent how many men do you have stickers uh, and and all this. So it's a yeah general question about uh, representation of a of a physical object uh, within the game. So yeah, I don't know if you can see, but there's there's no stickers on these. They're, they're just colored blocks, and they uh, they represent from hundreds to to thousands of men, depending on kind of where they on the where they are on the board and what what color they are. I mean, essentially. Uh, there are, to scale, there are far fewer red tokens than there ought to be, given, given how vastly out, outnumbered the, the, the knights were by the, by the Turks, but that's to do with playability and just, just kind of game balance. And, and there's far fewer, there's very few uh, blue box. But then again, these are the knights' hospitalers, so they actually have a tradition of being able to kind of patch themselves up. They know something about medicine albeit primitive by our standards but they they kind of tend to recycle a bit more and come off the ball and occasionally they can come back so so yes i mean all of these blocks there's like 20 something red blocks but they uh you know that that's trying to represent forty thousand men and there's uh, far fewer about 10 blocks that are uh, that are blue that represent the six thousand knights knights and maltese and various other people who fought with them and just one comment but we won't, don't engage, Maurice, but I think it's a nice comment from Niels here saying, are you thinking maybe a Constantinople siege version could work? Uh, from what you've said, I, I think it, it makes a lot of sense, but I guess maybe there are some projects around it, but I think it's a, it's a nice comment from Niels here. But that will close the topic. Uh, thanks again for talking about the historical context of the game, showing a bit more about your game once again. Uh, uh, the, the link to the Kickstarter campaign is in the description, but I think we've went way overboard. So I think the campaign is now over. So, uh, so that's the thing. And now I'm going to bring in a few new people to the stream. So we have Dan coming, Dave and Peter, and let's see how it handles five of them. Hi everyone. Thanks for Hi. joining. So as I was saying at the beginning of the stream, um, uh, we're going to have some extra guests at the end because we're going to talk about um, uh, a new podcast uh, that was recently launched by um, by uh, Dave and Pete here. Uh, and basically the, the, the reason why I thought it would make sense to have um, uh, to have it at the end of your presentation, Maurice, and also to invite Dan, that is a friend of yours, to, to that uh, final segment, uh, is that uh, Pete and Dave are actually launching a, a new podcast about Wargaming, and their first series of podcasts is about the Consim Game Jam. Uh, so for those who don't know, the Consim Game Jam was an event that was held uh, late last year, and it's basically, uh, it was around 40 people in uh, in small groups of three or four trying to make a war game in uh, over a weekend 
and you, Maurice, with Dan actually participated in that um, in that event, and Peter actually participated too. But he's here for the podcast, so I won't get confused. But I, I thought it was interesting because um, so Peter and Dave here are are going to have this full series where they are talking about the co-founders of the Consume Game Jam, the different juries, and also uh, some participants, uh, the one that were the top three uh, picks from from the jury at the end. And both of you are interviewed. So Dan and Maurice are, are interviewed by uh, by Pete and Dave within that. Uh, uh, within that series but first of all thanks everyone for for joining how are you guys doing yeah good, good thank you, thank you. <laughs> great uh but that's uh that's really cool so maybe um maybe i will give you the i will let you talk uh pete and dave and let that talk to us about uh about that podcast project and and uh, and what's the idea the idea behind it yeah so i mean the first thing to say is obviously who organized the um consume jam fred <laughs> who, whose idea was it <laughs> So that's that's uh, so for those of you who watched uh, Stephen's uh, session with me on 300 uh, a few days ago, uh, I am very good at uh, at self promotion. So it's a bit of this thing where I do uh, different things. So I was uh, I was the co-founder of the Consume Game Jam, and I'm inviting people to talk about a podcast that talk about something that I did, which is very weird, but that's that's just the way it is. I guess that's what you wanted to hear, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, so um, I was a participant in the Game Jam. Um, at the time, I was also doing playtesting for the Congress of Vienna um, game that's currently in development for GMT on the P500. Uh, and that's how I know Dave. And I was just telling him about the experience, and he was saying you know, how interesting it sounded. And, and um, we'd been batting around the idea of maybe doing some kind of project before. We did some fairly daft videos um, introducing Congress of Vienna before um, for Inside GMT. And we were looking for the next project. And I can't remember even which one of us came up with the idea, but it came up and we talked about it and we just thought, yeah, well, let's let's go ahead with it. Um, and then, you know, it was all steam ahead, wasn't it, Dave? Because we were talking about doing it at the start of November and we started recording, you know, record time at the start of January and it's being released now in May. So um, yeah, very much yes. it's been a slow, slow haul. Um, some of that has to do with um, how long it took to kind of arrange to, to talk to some people. Jason Carr, obviously, it's very hard to pin down. Um, but it's a, it's a hobby podcast. Um, we're just doing it in our spare time. Uh, we have no uh, desire to monetize it, at least we're not. But how is it called? How is it called? It's the Spicy Fish Board Game Podcast. Great. Uh, and we can find it on Spotify and other podcast platforms, right? Yes, indeed. It's hosted on Anchor, which distributes automatically to a lot of other uh, platforms. So. OK, so th this first uh, series focus on, on the Consume Game Jam. And maybe before talking about the, the series of episodes, now that we have Dan here that, that just joined us. So Dan, you, you went through the this uh, this very tense uh, or very demanding event that is the Consume Game Jam, the idea of making a war game in three days. What, and you were working with Maurice on this. What was your experience of the of the Consume Game Jam in a, in a, in a few words? In a few words. Um, it was really satisfying very exhausting um we had the advantage of i'm in the uk morris is in the east coast us so he'd go to sleep i'd get on with work i'd go to sleep he'd wake up and sort of pick up the baton so it kind of worked quite well for us in that way but um it was the first time i've worked so intensely on a game you know sort of intensive uh three-day period but by and large i've carried on since so um, it, it was good. It gave me a real sort of rocket to work on my own designs afterwards and uh, continue to sort of, you know, channel the enthusiasm that I got from taking part in the event, really. Yeah. And and so you you I guess that uh, in the process of doing the interviews and and just for for me to have the the full context, Dave, who did you interview um, in the in the process of of making this first uh, series of podcasts on the Consume Game Jam? Oh, we cannot hear you, Dave. Uh, See, Dave's Dave. a professional podcaster now. So yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently has problem with mics. That's very promising for the podcast. Very <laughs> promising, I must say. 
So maybe in the in the meantime, while Dave is trying to to figure out, I think if you go in the options and, and look into the the cam mic option, um, you might find it. But maybe Peter, so so who did you interview during the process? Yeah. So first, a um, couple of people we interviewed were obviously yourself, Fred, and co-founder uh, Joe Dewhurst. Um, honorable mention to Sean as well, then Australia, who I think provided technical support. Um, so that was episode one, sets the scene, talk to the judges about where the whole Quantum Jam comes from. Um, then we have three single episodes with the judges. So we start off uh, with Morgan Guyon Retti, um, designer of Pendragon and currently designing Hubris. Um, then we move on to Volko Runke, obviously the founder of the Coin series and currently working on the campaign, um, what they call the Levian campaign series. Um, and then third, we had Jason Carr, lead developer now at uh, GNT Games, who was also a participant. He, he did his own solo effort uh, to get into the mindset of what it's like, what is possible to achieve. Um, so he wasn't running as a, as a competitor and a judge. Um, and then we have the top three ranking teams. So we go three, two, one. Um, and those are, oh God, in the shadows, which is currently on P500. Then we talk almost to, to five, Paris. almost to 500. Almost to 500. Yes. <laughs> go on GMT's page. It's almost on 500. This game needs to make the cut as soon as possible. And then we have the number two team, which is Morris and Dan. Um, and then finally, uh, the first place team, which is Vijay Nagara, who I believe you interviewed uh, recently. Yes, yeah, they were on the on the show uh, a, a few weeks ago. Uh, I think it was just before they breached 500. And by the way, Matthew is in the chat. Uh, and uh, yeah, he's saying actually four more for In the Shadows to be at 500. And, uh, and Vijay Nagara actually breached uh, 500 uh, a while ago. So as you were saying, Peter, uh, Dan and Morris worked on uh, Boudicca's Revolt. And just for context, the theme of the first concept game jam was to recycle a con game. So you were to use the wooden pieces and the board, and then you can come up with any cardboard or cards you wanted. And uh, Dan and Maurice, you came up with Boudicca's Revolt, uh, which was thought as an extension expansion of uh, of Pendragon from from uh, from Morgan. Uh, so just maybe a, a quick update on, on this one, because as Peter said, I, uh, In the Shadows and Vijay Nagar are on P500. Any plans on your uh, game that came out second on, 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 on any publishing deal? Is there anything that is in the works or... Is it a sensitive topic? I, I see you, Dan, being a bit uncomfortable. Maurice is not saying anything, looking just in front of the camera. Is it, am I touching a, a sensitive to to topic here? No, no, no. It's, it's been very all-consuming, actually, even since the game jam. So we, you know, um, the judges had some very interesting ideas after, and some great feedback afterwards. So we sort of took those on board, plowed ahead, and tried to create, I think, two or three additional scenarios looking at um, the Silurus Rebellion and um, Agricola's campaigns as well. <clears throat> and that's kind of morphed. I guess I should let Morris take over there. Um, but yeah, we, we haven't stopped working on it, certainly. And uh, that's I'll an excellent him... news. Yeah, so we, we worked on it a bit more. So we, our game was uh, coinish. And then, and, and we made these additional scenarios that were less coiny. And we we talked to Morgan and to Jason and felt that actually, so we really sort of had it, we're at a crossroads where we could make our game Boudicca's Revolt. We could make it really a legitimate expansion for Pendragon and move closer, much more within the Pendragon system. Or, or the option was, or, or we kind of cut loose from Pendragon and we we go a, a sort of a, a different route where uh, sort of encouraged by Jason's discussion with those other two teams where, as, as you know, they kind of generated this irregular uh, warfare. Conflict series, yeah. Thank you, irregular conflict series. And, and so Jason was saying, well, look, uh, there's this other series that means you don't have to, if you don't want to conform to coin exactly, you don't have to, there are other options. Uh, so uh, the regular conflict series is an option, or, or he said uh, another option is you might even decide that you, you've got something that you want to develop that really becomes a series in its own right. So we said, okay, look, let us think about that. We thought about it. We decided we were more interested in seeing what happened if we, if we just kind of just let loose and just 
took those ideas and kind of developed them without the the, the restriction of, of necessarily conforming to coin and kind of trying to sit inside that. So we've been developing uh, a, a number of scenarios that relate still to Roman Britain. And uh, we, we've we now got uh, about three or four functioning scenarios with solo play and multiplayer play, all based on different aspects of early Roman Britain. And we've now, Dan's been doing a fantastic job getting this stuff on Tabletop Simulator. And we've still been in touch with, with Jason. Yeah. And we are hoping to show him at the end of the month what we have. And, uh, you know, we're just tremendously excited about it. We, we, we think we've got a, uh, not just a game, but perhaps a system uh, that, that maybe could run to a series. We'll, we'll see, that's obviously not our, our call, but we, we're just really thrilled with what we've been able to, to develop that definitely has its roots in what we did in that game jam, but has, has evolved many times since. Okay, so Maurice, you got me extremely curious. After the stream, we probably need to have a chat because I want to know more about that system. <laughs> but, uh, um, if you would, if I can share my screen, I can give you a sneak preview. Yeah, of yeah, you, op open at the moment. Um, yeah, you can share your screen and, and let's let's put it on the. We can put it differently okay, in the in the stream. So share screen and yeah, I've got two monitors. So screen. So this two. is a game we're calling rebellion britannia right now and uh right let's see okay this is going to be confusing trying to do two things at once um so yeah it, this is the prototype map and uh i've sort of set up for the various scenarios so there's the claudian invasion the Silurius revolt boudicca's rebellion agricola's campaigns um, and hopefully a, a sort of grand campaign that will feature all of these various factions. So Rome, the Iceni, Brigantes, Vico Magi, Silures, and Catuvelani. Um, but yeah, so we're kind of using Tabletop Simulator to play test and try and refine it and iron out any obvious kinks. And um, that's kind of where we are at the moment, really. It, that looks awesome, and I and I second uh, NB's uh, comment about th this looks pretty insane. I want to know a lot more now. I'm very very curious, but that looks really really cool. Thanks for 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 sharing that. Uh, no maybe so. Let's. J I just have a question for for Dave and, and Peter again. Let's check if Dave's mic is working or not. Uh, or if is that yes he does he's not just good looking now he we can also hear him so that's that's because it was nice to have you just but, but then i think it's it's nice i have a question for you um so you, as you said you i interviewed a, um like a, a pretty broad uh scope of people that participated in that first concert game jam so the the organizers uh the jury but also participants and i was wondering so in that in that first series of interview was there a moment or a specific bit of the interview that you thought was particularly fun or particularly interesting like that that like that that moment where you felt oh this is going to be this is going to be really cool i'm really happy to have this on tape yeah i think that happened to, uh, correct me if i'm wrong peter i think that happened a few times we had kind of the same questions for everybody but then we went off script a little bit uh certainly maurice and dan can uh, attest to that um but uh for example i we asked uh voco runke when do you know a design is going to work out? And he said, he called it the Energizer Bunny moment where the system just sort of kicks in and you realize it works. Um, and uh, that kind of thing happened, I think, with everybody in, in terms of um, getting like a glimpse behind the curtain of game design. Everybody had a really interesting take on things. And uh, I think that's the that's the real fun of doing a podcast and, and talking to people is you might not otherwise have had access to. And then you get some interesting um, perspectives that, uh, um, you know, kind of enlighten the whole process, because it does seem like a bit of wizardry. I'm sure Maurice and Dan have been uh, slaving away at, at this design. Uh, but at some point, I'm sure, or maybe multiple points, they've had that moment where they were like, this is really cool. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. Yeah, and so I am. Um, oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead. I was going to say my my one moment, if I was to pick one moment, was exactly that. 
energizing, buzzy, and money moment. Um, but yeah, the, if you want to find out what game Jason Carr got given by um, Gene Billingsley when he visited GMT for the first time, you can find out in this podcast. Um, and we had great conversations with lots of guys, like these two guys, Morris and Dan, uh, was a standout one. Um, the guy with in, in the Shadows um, just came across how much they thought about game design. Um, you know, everybody has, but that one was one that stood out to me. Um, Vijay Nagara was just so much fun because um, you know, we had four people, it was a bit more chaotic, um, and it's just such a great game. Um, and if you want to find out what my favorite faction in that was, you can find out in the in the end of that. That's maybe one of the less exciting moments um, for most people, but it's, it was an interesting bit for me. <laughs> and it's, it's a good point be, about Vijay Nagara, and that's I think also the, one of the strengths of the game is that it's for very different people, and I think they all bring something different to the to the mix, and that's probably one of the strengths of the game is that they have such different perspective, different strength, and it's uh, it really shows when you when you get to know them and when you speak to them, it's a uh, it's a it's a really cool uh, it's yeah it's a it's a really cool team. Um, yeah, it's, great. it's interesting as well because they're all play testers. None of them actually have a published design to their name. Um, okay. The first place team. So. Yes, and wow. that's the thing that I want to also say to to the people who might want to join Consume Game Jam Edition Two. It's open to people with no uh, game design experience, and that's actually the whole point. Uh, we might uh, add you in teams where is experienced game designers who can actually learn stuff, or you might end up with just random people that have absolutely no experience in game design. And sometimes cool stuff are going to come out of it. I think Vijay Naga is a very good example of that. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's uh, that's really cool. Um, so. Your first series of episodes, so it's seven episodes focused on the Consume Game Jam. Did you already have some thoughts about uh, like a, a series number two? And if so, what are you thinking could be the topic? Dave, do you want to go for this one? We're going to arm wrestle for the next one. Uh, <laughs> virtually. <laughs> virtually. Actually, we, the guy, we were talking about this yesterday, and I think the guiding light is going to be um, just as... Uh, people who enjoy the hobby, what do we think people would enjoy listening to? Is it something we would want to listen to if we were, you know, roaming around looking for, for a podcast? And um, we've talked about a, um, a bunch of different things, uh, reviewing or interviewing board game reviewers. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of popular uh, uh, board game reviewers out there. We've talked about... Um, uh, Peter, remind me, uh, we, yesterday we were talking about um, two or three other ideas too. What were they? Um, so the sort of main idea is that we wanted to play through these interviews. Um, and there are a few designs that I'm excited about that I would like to, to have people on to talk about. One of the objectives, I think, at the start is to try and disguise the fact that we're going to be talking to people we already know and that we're kind of friends with. <laughs> Um, but yeah, one of the designs I'm keen um, to explore is the British Way four pack, uh, which Stephen Regans is, is designing currently, um, and I'm helping to playtest to develop um, in a small capacity. Um, and another is I would like to go back to Congress of Vienna uh, at some point, maybe not right away, because I've, I've, Dave and I have literally just produced a, an example of battle video, so I'd quite like a, a short break from Congress of Vienna, uh, but it would be fantastic to get the, some of those guys on because they're real, real good fun. Um, and we got a few other designs that are, are lurking. But yeah, early okay. days, yeah, we'll, we'll see what's fun. But when you do, let me know. We'll would be very happy to have you back on the show and talk a bit about the, the people that you've met. Uh, but I guess that's we're an hour and a half in. Um, I don't know if anyone has a last comment, something to say, a question, or anything. Or it's good to see Maurice and Daniel again after uh, a while. Uh, we are, yeah. that, that was a few months ago when we last talked. It was. Yeah. Have if you've been keeping well. Uh, yes, uh, this has been keeping us busy too through this kind of interesting time period. Exactly. No, the, I can't. Con I mean, the Consum Game Jam has helped fill my time in a difficult period very well. So yeah. you know, I, I heartily recommend it. Which is and, actually maybe a good transition because I guess there are some questions around: Will there be a Consum Game Jam number two? Uh, and the answer is yes. Uh, and then the second question is when, and we're thinking about September uh, this year. Uh, so we'll uh, we'll keep you posted on on this. And I mostly picked September to make sure that Morris can join, 
because uh, Maurice cannot join earlier than September and, and for very good reasons. I guess I don't know if you want to comment, <laughs> Maurice. <laughs> yeah, so, so one of the questions that Peter and David asked me was, okay, so I don't remember the exact formulation of the question, but it's something like, so, so what happened? You had, you had the brief, how did, what, how did you respond? What happened next? And I said, well, so about an hour in, my partner said, could she just have a word and pulled me into the bathroom and showed me something that meant that, well, so she was pregnant. So this was, this was difficult to kind of um, <laughs> concentrate on the game while this was going on. So yeah, so now I have this, I call him my consim son. He's, he's due in a, uh, a few weeks. And um, yeah, hopefully by September, he will be ready to play test and be useful. <laughs> Finally be useful, yes. You described it as distracting in the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm just, there's just lots of things going on. I've like, got to make this game, but I just, um, I'm, Dan's going to think I'm a squeaky wheel if I'm mm -hmm. kind of not focusing. And so, yeah, it, it was it was just a lot to. Um, so yes, so that's I don't know that seems to be what happens every time there's a concert. Okay, so maybe in September, uh, another good surprise when you have when you have <laughs> yeah. <a> to... <laughs> But great, I'll keep yeah, everyone posted on the on the on the second one. Uh, but yeah, I'm actually yes. <laughs> That's a, that was a, because it was something you reached out and you asked me about the Consume Game Jam number two because and then you announced me that yeah you had uh, a baby that was in the planning since the the first edition so it will come late enough for you to be able to participate I hope to have all of you coming back for for Consume Game Jam number two um, and the uh, Mark Herman uh, said on a multiple occasions that he wanted to be part of the jury so we'll make sure that he's part of the jury. And of course, that would imply that we'll make the theme uh, relevant to Mark Herman. So that's a big hint. But mm. uh, yeah, basically, that's yeah. the uh, we'll make uh, we'll make it about uh, about something that can also work with uh, with his career and just uh, also a tribute to everything that he's brought to the hobby. But cool! It was awesome to have all of you. Thanks a lot for for taking the time, uh, Maurice, uh, Dan, uh, Peter, and, and Dave. That was that was really fun. Uh, I hope to have you back, Peter and Dave, back on the on the show to talk about a lot of new podcasts that you're gonna release in the future. Uh, I haven't. Uh, I just started uh, listening to them um, uh, earlier today. Uh, I know that uh, Sean in the in the chat actually has already uh, finished the first two episodes already, and was very enthusiastic about it when we talked about it on Discord. So it looks like you did an amazing job. So Spicy Fish, new wargaming podcast, uh, strongly recommend. Uh, thanks everyone for 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 coming tonight. It was extremely fun, Maurice. We probably need to have some follow up discussions on a few topics, uh, but it was great. Uh, so that was uh, that was excellent. And everyone, have a have a good night. Thank you for having me. Great. Thanks, everyone. Good to see you guys. Thank you.